Good evening and welcome back to the Not So Perfect Bigfoot Show. I'm your host, Miss V. Before we start the show tonight, I'd like to give a shout out to the North Carolina researchers. We had a convention, I believe it was Hamlet, North Carolina. I wasn't able to go. Husband's at a conference. So we have um, friends out and you worry probably some out and come not North Carolina. Just want to give a shout out, tell them to be safe, go hunt the big guy and enjoy. Tonight's guest is Jack Warren. Jack is an Ohio researcher. I really enjoy talking to him. I, I kind of stopped him through his page when someone dropped his name to him. Just a really good guy. Jack has three passions in life. Hunting, tracking, and looking for the big hairy man. Jack, you've been in it for eight years. You want to take it from there? I sure do, Victoria, and thank you for having me on. And hello, everybody. Um, it all started back when I retired. My wife, she goes, well, I think you better find a hobby. And uh, I was watching the show on TV one night, and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck are those people doing? I says, I got to go out and do this. So I told the wife, I'm going Bigfooting. I says, <laughs> if I can find a rabbit, I can find a Bigfoot. So that led to my uh, my journey. And it's been a really great one. And I've been blessed. Uh, the first people I've gotten in touch with is uh, SOSB, the Southeastern Ohio Bigfoot Investigation Society. And... Uh, they took me under their wings and introduced me to a lot of great folks. I've been to a lot of their campouts and meetings. Uh, some of the people there have very, very good stories uh, from Bigfoot to uh, Dogman to UFO abductions. One lady there, she was on the show Finding Bigfoot on her story about uh, her and her two daughters or her kids. We're at a school playground and they looked in the woods, wood line there, and there was a female Bigfoot there watching them. Wow. And not only that, she was also abducted when she was a small child. And she even showed me the implant in the paw in the back of her hand that they put wow. in her. She still has it today. And she's pushing almost 70 years old. So um, Literally, she has nothing to gain by coming out with a story about that. Just putting no. out there and tell the truth. No, it's just great people sitting around a campfire. I think our biggest crowd down there one night was 80 people. Wow. Sitting around a campfire, talking Bigfoot. And everybody smiles, waves. We chat, we get along together, and that's what it's all about sharing. And uh, I've been blessed. And then later on in my journey, I met Jay Fouch, which is one of the co-founders of Coshocton County Bigfoot, along with uh, Bob Gross. Uh, rest in peace. We lost Bob uh, last year. And Larry Felsky, Bill Walsh. Uh, there's a few others, myself, my wife, Becky, Jay's wife, Kim. And I apologize if I forgot to mention anybody else, but we said we were going to keep the group small. The smaller, the better. Well, as of today, we got 1,700 members. Wow. Yes. And Jay is a dedicated, he is a hunter. He is a gatherer. And he is a researcher. What I mean by gatherer, he goes out and collects mushrooms, ginseng, medicinal roots, and plants. And he sells them to supplement his income for his family. Well, that's when the Bigfoots got involved into his life. He was robbing their pantry. And they didn't like that. <laughs> and Jay has some fantastic pictures and videos. I, I'm laying in bed at night at midnight and the phone rings. It's Jay. 
he's over here. He's seen this. Here, you got to see this. And he's showing me pictures. He's showing me videos. Jay is a super nice guy. And uh, I've been out with him quite a bit and learned a lot from him, especially the mushrooms, the plants that they use and they eat to survive along with meat, fish, shellfish. Uh, of course, they need water. And in Kashakton, there's a lot of water in Kashakton. So that contributes to the success Jay has because they need water. And he watches the waterways. And that's where he gets a lot of his nice captures. Uh, other than that, uh, I've seen a possible Bigfoot two times. I know I tell people, uh, yes, I've seen Bigfoot twice. One was at night walking through a cornfield. Now, mind you, the corn is seven feet tall, if not taller. We had mm -hmm. night vision, and we all shared it because we only had the one one thing. And uh, it was a good three and a half feet above the corn and wide across the shoulders. And it was about 200 yards walking away from us. And we were on private property. We were a guest. So we couldn't go running through the guy's cornfield to try to find evidence of what we saw was there. And plus, wow. we would have gotten lost because this is a huge cornfield. I mean, we're talking miles and miles and miles and miles, and I'm not exaggerating, of cornfield that runs along, I think it's the Mustingham River or the Tuscaroras River down there. And it's also known as the monkey farm, Jay likes calling it. And the oh. second sighting was uh, at the same place, but up by the farm, because they also have eggs, chickens, they lay eggs. They got like five huge buildings. And I was out by myself. I walked away from Jay and them, and I'm watching this hillside, and out of the woods walks this about a five foot tall black thing comes into a clearing where they mowed between the two wood lines and it walked down toward me and then stooped down and like it was looking at me and I was looking at it. I had no phone, no nothing with me and I'm just watching it in pure amazement. I'm going, wow, what's the chances of this happening? And now we watched each other for probably two minutes. And then it got up, walked back into the woods. And this was in late fall. There were no leaves on the trees. And this was the side of a hill. And as it walked down through the trees, it kneeled back down next to these three other black things that were in the woods about the same size as it was. So that was a young one. Um, I found lots of footprints. I've been paralleled a lot by these critters. I've had a 30-pound rock thrown at me. When I was down in a creek bottom looking at a trackway of a female and a small one that were walking in the creek that left prints. And this was about in my second year of Bigfooting. And it happened at Salt Fork. And um, I heard two footsteps on the hillside walk away from me. Now, mind you, there were no leaves on the trees. I did not see nothing. I scanned. I was going to run up there, but something told me, no, leave. It doesn't want you here. And so I got up to my buddies. They were on the upper path. And they said, yeah, we seen the rock come through the trees because it actually hit a maple sapling that was probably 40 foot tall. And it almost bent it down to where it almost touched the creek and sprung back up. That's how big this rock was. So when we got back to camp, I told those people about it. And I called my buddy, Johnny Freeman in southwestern PA. He's a psychic. Plus, he's also a researcher. And he said, yeah, he says, I know that happened. He says, 
you were probably getting too close to where they were bedded down or it there was the female was there with a young one and it wanted you out of there and i said so, yes yeah, proud that makes sense because there was a 14 inch footprint and then there was about a four to five inch footprint behind her and how i found it i seen this disturbance on the side of the hill well she fell down and she did like a hip slide down the hill and into the creek because i seen where her foot was pushing the pile of leaves that ended up in the, the creek where it stopped her and there i wish i would have known more because i would have taken pictures of her hip impression in the mud and i should have looked for hair but i didn't a, i was a rookie as a tracker it's safe to say you know what you were looking at yes and i think i think like an animal when i'm out there but i also think if i want to survive what can i do so a predator doesn't find me or follow me what am i going to do well i'm going to use mother nature I'm gonna walk down this washout because I know when it rains, it's gonna wash my tracks away. Or I'm gonna walk on these rocks and they're not gonna be able to track me if I'm walking on rocks. But I have found a footprint on top of a rock before because it was wet. They just went through there. I, I love creeks, I love ravines, what we call down here, you guys call them hollows or hollers um they use those a lot and when you're on a trail you're going to find most of your evidence not on the trail but off the trail about 40 feet because these things will parallel you through the woods there's there's always from what i'm told two males will always look out for a female and her young that's their job and they're two younger males because they're very protective of one another. And uh, I also learned that when I'm in the woods through the years, educate yourself on what Mother Nature does because a lot of the structures and tree bends and tree breaks, um, probably 95% of that is Mother Nature or human. The rest is um, contributing to the the big guy because I've what? seen tree twist and I've educated myself on a thing called winter freeze, especially up here in northeastern Ohio, <clears throat> where there's a hole in a tree, a knot, and what happens, water will drip down in through there, and when it freezes, ice expands. And I'll actually snap a tree right in half. And it'll look just like a tree break without a twist. But we do have so, trees up here that do have a natural twist to them when they grow. So what, when you're talking about arches, um, what do you think the arches mean? I was told several things. And I do have a book called Wood Talk. And a friend of mine is very good at Wood Talk. He's a researcher, Rich McCandlish, down in Southern Ohio. And he's been doing research on these grass, men, he calls them, for 53 years. An arch could mean leaning, leading toward water, leaning, uh, leading you toward a game trail, we went this way does the arch have a lot of foliage on it they could use it as a blind oh here comes somebody let's bend this tree over with the leaves on it and it'll hide us because they can blend in a uh, good friend of mine out of pennsylvania jonathan lackey he has <clears throat> very good samples of sasquatch hair and it's translucent it bends and refracts light so just like a polar bears a polar bear is actually brown but they appear white because of their hair and uh they can pick up the color in their background 
and reflect it through their hair. So now you got a black Sasquatch could be green because I've heard of people walking right by them when they're standing right there beside them. You could stick your arm out and actually touch them. That's how well so, they they blend in. So that leads me to a question. Um, when they talk about, I, I think it was Ohio, when they say it has a green tint, that would be... Got you. So, so I believe it's in Ohio where they said the uh, grass man has a green tint to it. Well, it all depends on its background. I mean, if it's living in a swamp or a marsh, you're going to pick up the allergy allergy that's in a marsh or a swamp. Like down south, they say they're green and they're covered with moss or seaweed or whatever. If you're living in a marsh, you would turn green. Yeah. But know. what it is, is they can pick up the background of what they're in. That's why they can disappear because they can reflect the light and you you won't be able to see them. They're cloaked. That's what they mean when they say cloaked. Yes. So you don't think they're interdimensional? I've heard stories that they are. And I have a very interesting story. It happened at Salt Fork by two very good friends of mine. And I would trust these two with my life. They were driving down a road in a caravan. They stopped, and on the side of the road was this thing standing there. It was huge. It had no head. Its body had these holes of light through it and spots. And then all of a sudden, it disappeared in a very active Bigfoot area. Wow. Yeah. That's all, that's, that's all I can say about that one, Jack. Wow. That's that's what I said about it. Wow. And uh, I heard a story. Not too far from this sighting, people were driving down the road. One walked out in front of the main car. There was cars behind them, another caravan, people looking for Bigfoot. And the creature was standing in the middle of the road and just disappeared into thin air wow. so are they interdimensional i don't know but i believe that they could probably go from where they're at they could probably go maybe 20 30 yards away in an instant by being cloaked and you would you would you would you would think they just vanished that's like you hear these stories about hunters or frontiersmen that have these stories. Well, we shot at it, but our bullets went right through it. it now, very... I think that when they approached this creature and seen it, they were probably, their adrenaline was pumping so much. It's like deer hunting. When I first went deer hunting, I shot a deer seven times well the the deer ended up running away i went over there where she was standing and all seven rounds of mine were in the dirt right in front of her that's called buck fever <laughs> so it does happen that's a perfect example is that what happened to these guys that said they shot it and the bullets yeah. were going right through it no, I think it would, they were bad aims because I've well, heard people shooting them and killing them or wounding them. I can kind of relate to that because in law enforcement, when you get in a close um, in, a, in a close quarter shootout, um, when people are drawing their guns and backing off, most of their rounds go on the ground, and, and you're you're your uh firepower or your your i hate to say suspect because it it kind of sounds negative but the person that's firing on you and you're trying to fire back on them you're retreating and you're trying to get off rounds and most of your rounds they teach us most of the rounds will go in the ground 
I mean, it's, that's why they say train, train, train. Right. So I, I can see where rounds will be thrown off. <gasps> correct. Plus you're under duress. Yeah, you're not correct. thinking. You're not thinking. Your your heart's pumping. Your blood's flowing through your body. You're getting lightheaded. You're getting nauseated probably. I'm not saying a, a law enforcement officer, but in some cases, probably yes. But They're humans. When, you, when you're faced with a creature that's eight, nine feet tall, six, seven, eight hundred pounds, uh, I'm waiting for that day to happen because I've been close. And I don't so know what I'm going to do. So when you had this 30, approximately 30 pound, what, to me is a boulder thrown at you. Do you think <laughs> it was they rock. were trying? <laughs> That's, it was a big a rock. Boulder. <laughs> okay. All right. This big rock. When you um, had this uh, big 30 pound rock thrown at you, do you think it was trying to hit you or do you think no. it just walked no. out the. If he wanted to hit me, he could have did it with no problem. Now, mind you, this place was full of ledges and caves, outcroppings. All the rocks there had moss on them or were gray. They showed signs of weathering. Now, I went back there and I found that rock because that's how I knew it weighed 30 pounds. Because I was going to go up there and I was going to track this critter. But oh. something told me, don't do it. This rock was totally brown and it was dry. It came out of a cave or under a rock cropping where it saw no weather. Wow, so she came she came armed, didn't she? Well, it came out when he noticed I was down there and I was tracking the female and the baby. I was they were fresh tracks. They were just made. The hip slide was fresh. It, 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 they probably, she fell when we started headed up that pathway. She fell down because we caught them. They were probably going down to get water because it was in a creek. So they're probably protecting young or family. Yep. And All she right. was probably still down there hiding under a bank or one of the outcroppings in the crack, and it wanted to say, hey, don't go no further. He wanted to distract me and get me out of there, and he did it. Wow. He did his job. I've had, I have had that happen twice to me, once to me and my wife. But not the rock thrown. I had a tree pushed over. We heard a small wood, wood knock over a ravine it was about a 300 foot drop down to a creek i said did you hear that and she said yes i says it's 25 yards in front of us over down there we can look in the river something's down there we got him well as soon as we turned around and started walking that way behind us crash boom this big old ash tree got pushed over into a tulip tree Broke the tulip tree in half, and the ash tree fell on the ground. I turned around. This was 75 yards behind us. And when I turned around and got there to see what did it, the leaves on the trees were still falling down from where this huge ash tree got pushed over. I did not hear anything, and I did not see anything. But whatever it was, it drew our attention away from what was down into the river. And they, again, I called my buddy Johnny in Southwestern PA. He said, yeah, I know what happened. He said there was a mother down there with a young one and they were either bathing or they were getting something to drink and the male didn't want you to look over there and see them because you, they, were, they had nowhere to go. Once again, wow. Yes, that's that's was in our that still is today our research area. And it's probably 
10 miles from my house. It's on the Grand River Lowlands, it's called. And what did I say? Follow the water. Follow the water. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody followed the water back in the day. The Indians, the settlers, animals, everybody. It's amazing. So you yeah, just what, woke up. What you learn about these things and use common sense, they're not that hard to find. Now, if you're ever going to get a sighting, I can guarantee you one thing. You're not going to see them unless they want you to see them. And when that, that happens, then you develop the trust. They trust you. Because they can feel inside you what your true intentions are toward them. And I believe that. I believe everything's about your energy. I mean, the world has energy. Right. We have Frequency, energy. energy. You're right. And but I'm wondering I'm, something about that, too. I'm open to hear that. What's that? I am open to hear that, sir. Oh, I'm I'm not even I haven't even scratched the surface on that. But I have some friends that are into that big time. Jamie and Jenny King. And two wonderful people. And if you ever get them on your show, uh they you would love them. They're I'm great great right, people. I'm writing their names down right now, sir. Yep. So out of all your areas that you like to go out, uh, how, do, how do you start your research? Do you start it with a basic track? Do you go into area that you last had experience? Well, I started reading and joining groups. I was going out with Ohio Bigfoot hunters uh tim stover and ed Wheelan to their research area it took me about a year for them to call me one day and invite me to go out with them and that was that was pretty good experience now i did find a footprint that night when we did go out and that was at night but i know where to look for the footprints I think like they think. And um, after that, uh, I went to uh, my first Ohio Bigfoot conference. I think that year there was like 40,000 people there. And I got bored. I says, this, this ain't for me. I says, let's go. We need to be in the woods. Well, we went for a drive. It was my first, first, no, second time at Salt Fork. And we went down this road and we went for a walk. And I says, holy crap, I can't believe it. And I go, what? I said, come here quick. Again, I'm still a rookie. I had no tape measure. I didn't put my cigarette pack down for a size comparison because I get yelled at that all the time. Still do. Uh, there was a footprint in the marsh. It was, uh, I believe it was nine inches. No one is going to be walking in a marsh full of cut grass, mud in their bare feet. And, uh, I, I took a picture of it and I took it back and I showed Jeff Meldrum it. He was there at the conference and I showed Cliff Brockman. He was there and they said, where'd you get this at? And I said, down this road. I, I went, we went driving around because I was bored here. <laughs> and uh, they liked it. <laughs> You're a character, buddy. <laughs> You're a handful. Oh yeah. oh yeah. I tell like it is. I know I'm I don't sugarcoat anything. I like that. So you get a lot of stories and you, you collect a lot of 
data from people that have had experience. I think that is my most favorite part of this journey is sitting around a campfire or getting a phone call and talking Bigfoot and listening to what other people want to share because of my exposure to all these people. I'm also putting these pieces together in my brain. That's, that's my journal. I don't write things down like a true researcher would, but I find a lot of similarities from people that don't know each other from Adam that see the same exact thing, think the same exact thing. And it's, and then when I find it, it's, it's the same what they've told me. So for the people that are non-believers and refuse to believe, I think one of the most frustrating things you can, I don't know what's going on in my yard, but I got to go check that out. But what I think one of the most frustrating things is to try to tell your story and just to have someone just to be so, as a matter of fact, like your lack of better words, a dumb a, you know, I, it, I mean, it's good to have someone to reach out to. I mean, I, I get called crazy anyway, but then when I start talking about my experience, you, I mean, people are just so sarcastic. There's, there's really no place to go. And I think it's great that you actually tell their story. But why is Ohio a hot spot? It just seems like to me, it's just a hot spot for Bigfoot and Dogman. Well, I think now that more people are out looking for them. I can't, oh, of all the counties, there's 88 counties in Ohio. The hottest county in the state of Ohio, believe it or not, is Portage County. That's up north. Why? You have more people. You go down to southern Ohio, which I believe there's a heck of a lot more Bigfoots down there. And I do believe there's several species of them. And uh, you get a handful of sightings here and a handful of sightings there. And they're not used to people. And when people go down there, that's when they have their encounters. Because they're curious. We go camping at our campground down at Salt Fork. And we literally had them come in to the campground at night, sometimes during the day, and they watch us. Mm -hmm. That one place I named the bleachers because I went back there one day and I found these two maple trees that were pushed over. They were about, oh, I'd say 10 inches in diameter, each one of them, but they were placed like bleachers. And I says, that's where the little ones sit. That's where we get all the eye shine from. We are their drive-in movie. Live TV. Yes, there's a lot of activity that goes on in our camp area. We got recordings. Uh, we've gotten vocals, eye shine, uh, hits on the thermal. I've seen a hand one day reach around a tree. I told nobody what color that arm was that I seen in hand because I seen the fur or the hair. Later on, my buddy Mike went back to his campsite where this thing was and he was cooking his supper. And when he looked up, there was a nine footer standing in the woods there looking right at him. Wow. I said, Mike, I whispered into my buddy's ear what color that hair was. I said, Mike, what color was it? And he said, Jack, it was brown. And my buddy goes, that's right. I said, Mike, I seen a brown arm wrapped around that tree right by your tent earlier in the day, but I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> so, so you've had quite a few experiences, but you had validation on that one. Oh, you? yes. Do you ever go out alone or do you? Oh, I go out alone all the time. Mm -hmm. My wife doesn't like it. My friends don't like it, but I should know better. But you know, what the heck? If, if it was meant to happen, it's going to happen. 
You know what I'm saying? That's how I look at it. I'm smart enough to not get into a situation. Uh, I have been hit with infrasound by myself in a creek bed looking at some snap trees. I got sick to my stomach. I got really dizzy. I pulled my gun. Well, I didn't pull my gun yet. I put my hand on my gun. And I stood up slowly because of the high embankment, there was a large thump on the other side of it, and I couldn't see over it. And I wasn't going to crawl up it to look on the other side because I wasn't feeling good. I thought I was going to pass out. So I backed out of there slowly, got up to the other side a little bit, and on the other small hill, and then I felt perfectly fine. But I had three quarters of a mile to go through this heavy pine forest to get to my car. What better place to ambush someone than in a pine forest? Exactly. So that's when I pulled my gun and I walked out of there. And I got to my car and I left. So do you think they have the ability, like, I know I've had an instant where I had heart palpations and felt like I couldn't breathe. Do you think they have that ability to have that effect on people? Yes. Uh, There's several animals that have that. They use that ability of infrasound. Tigers, elephants. You've got a uh, Facebook user. I can't see the name. It says, Jack, you are a print magnet. You found those prints the last time we went out, and unfortunately, I can't see who the Facebook user is. If you want to see your Facebook name, so oh, let's yeah. get back to. It. So, why do you think they would disorient orient people like that, or 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 have that effect on? That's an that's an intentional intentional action, right? Right. Why do you think they do that? I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. Best answer in the world when you aren't sure is to say that, not create one. I appreciate that. What's the, what's been yep. the most, what's been the most intense situation? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yep. What's been the, the most, most intense? intense? Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, uh, let me see. It was probably when the tree got pushed over. Okay. Because it was me and my wife. And where we were at, you are not allowed to have a firearm or a knife on you. So all we had was our walking sticks. And she was with me. I would be breaking the law, sir, because I would have something on me. I'm I don't sorry. do that. I would. I would. I would pay <laughs> for it later. I, um, I know how to survive. I know how so, to use a uh, stick. <laughs> and it's so a little Mark, bit bigger than a stick. Okay. I, I believe you, sir. Um, so that was Mike Hartmab that said that about you finding the... Prince. Yeah, Mike, he's a good guy. Did I just slaughter his last name? I'm good at that. Yes. Can you tell us about that one? He's a true outdoorsman and researcher. I mean, he, this guy, he does everything by the book. He can tell you anything you want to know probably about any animal out there what they eat, when they mate. I mean, he's a walking encyclopedia. Mike is a very good guy. And he also makes a nice fire so we can grill our hot dogs when we go out on research. He always brings us food. And Shane's got the coffee. That's the best kind of <laughs> So what's the story behind the prints that he's talking about? The last time you guys went out, we filmed prints. Uh, yes, we found a uh, print over on a uh, 
an area that they go to. And uh, then we went to another area, and I think we found a partial print there that he stepped right next to, to cross a creek. And I say, hey, Mike, did you step here? And he goes, no, I stepped over here. And I go, well, here, look, here's a print. And then Shane found a trackway from that print. And he got the spray paint now that he spray paints the foot impressions on top of the grass where it pushes the grass down from the weight of the body. And sure enough, there they were. They were, I think, 60 inch stride. 16 inch tracks 60 inch stride heel to heel yep so uh ralph wants to know how many times do you go out in a year jack oh god this year i haven't been out that much maybe i think i've probably been out uh, six times this year because I've been preoccupied with family obligations. Uh, we've gotten custody of two of our great nephews. Uh, one is 15 and the other one is 12, but they've lived with us since the one was three and the other one came right out of the hospital, but they were custody. My wife's mother had custody of them. And she passed away. So we just got that all settled in court. And now we have full custody of them. So, you know, that throws a wrench in uh, the researching part. But I, I get out whenever the phone rings. And if I can get away, Becky works, my wife. And uh, she doesn't drive. So if I can arrange transportation to get her to or from work, then I'm gone. <laughs> and where I go, I usually have to drive two and a half hours, three hours, one way to get there to meet up with my friends to go out with them. So you don't, what equipment do you take with you? I, li I like to hear what people take out. With I you. am, I own tons of equipment. I have a thermal imager. I have night vision. They all record. They do pictures, videos. You want to know something? I don't use any of it. But my wife bought it. I'm talking thousands of dollars of equipment. I have my phone. And I do now carry a tape measure. I have my knife. Okay. Uh, I have HydroCal. Sometimes I take it with me. Sometimes, most of the time, I leave it in the Jeep. Because it's too heavy to carry. Plus the water. Uh, I'm not that type of guy. I like going out and just finding things and being one with nature. That's my main objective is to get out in the woods and see what I can learn or see what I can find. So let's get back. To, if you don't mind, let's get back to some of your experiences. What has been the most amazing thing that you have come to realize about a Bigfoot that uh, people would probably question you on? What's the most most amazing thing you can know about a Bigfoot that you've been absolutely floored by that you're learning? You could have worded that better. Um, that they could be right next to you and you would never know they were there. I agree. What, what I, now? I've smelled them. Uh, not all of them stink because I've only smelled them twice. And one time, I believe it wasn't a Bigfoot. I believe it was a dog man. Now, I, I, why? I don't know, but just by the smell. I walked into this area. It was mowed tractor path, and the big pond up, up, up there was drained. I said, what better of a place to look for prints than right there? But as I got up there, they stopped mowing, and I didn't have any spray on. 
and I've been bit by ticks. I do not like ticks. And if I had a piece of equipment that I would carry with me all the time, it would be a flamethrower. That's how bad I hate ticks. They would, I would destroy them all. But anywho, I decided not to go any further. So I turned around and walked back. And when I got halfway down this mode tractor path, I smelled death. Bad. Now I wasn't there when I walked in. Now when I'm walking out, I'm smelling it. So I'm looking for a carcass. No carcass. Nowhere. And then I got that feeling. I put my hand on my gun and I walked to the road and started walking up. I kept looking behind me. I got in my car and I sat in my car and I'm going, what the heck? That thing was right there. There was no carcass. I even went back and looked and this, there was no smell, no nothing. No deer. I mean, it was pungent of rotten flesh. That's why I think it was a dog man. Uh, well, I'll run this by you. I'll tell you what I have figured out about odor. When we were out in the area one time, um, we had some pretty amazing activity that day. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Now, when I test my mic, I sing the rubber band, man. I'm just telling you. So if you can't hear me, I have to do the a verse of the rubber band. Man. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, when we were out there, we had some pretty amazing experiences. But the thing about the odor, I, I guess it's because how I describe it, it was like a stagnant water odor. And yes, we were in a swamp, and the marsh, and all that. But the odor was like there like right there and then gone. It didn't drift away. It didn't. It was like there and gone. Does that make sense to you? Yes. It, it just, you just get a sniff of it and then it's gone. Right. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. But to me, I say stagnant water and like a dog rolled over and something dead. But Exactly. That's exactly what I smelled. Plus the rotten flesh part. Here, I got a picture to show you. I don't know how I can do this. So I'm just going to hold it up and I'm going to turn the phone from me to the picture. Okay. Can you get it? Is there something standing under there or is that a uh, structure? You see it kneeling down? Oh, right. That, oh, yeah. So tell me the backstory behind that one, sir. Oh, how's that? Uh, there it is. Right there right it there. is. There you go. You see, it's time stamped, right? Yeah, you took that. That is a baby we did an investigation on. Well, all right. Come off the, spill the beans on that one, Jack. Let's talk now. That was on private property. Wow. Can we hear the story on that one? Yes. Uh, my buddy, Jay Fouch, that's his best fishing buddy. He lives down in um, Logan County. And he called Jay up one day and says, I need you down here now. I got something on my game camera. Now, this guy's a retired deputy sheriff. He's on his retirement property, him and his wife. And it's manicured 16 acres. And he's got hunting trails. And he loves to hunt also, deer hunt and turkey hunt. So he's got all these game cameras everywhere on this property. And one day he got this picture of this thing. Now, this is a small one. We're thinking. That the mother dropped it off up here on the trail and said, you stay here. I'm going to go into the pine forest and gather me a turkey or turkey eggs because they're easy to get. They burn very little calories trying to get stuff like that. Well, something got this thing's attention and he crawled down the trail 
and trip the game camera. Mm -hmm. Now, D, we did a size comparison when we went down there to do the investigation. Jay's 300 pounds, probably about 5'11". And this thing was a little bit bigger than Jay. Not much. Now, we called in a team, uh, Kane Michaels and Eric Tipton. They are top shelf researchers. These guys, when they go do an investigation, they bring duff duffel bags full of electronic equipment thermal imager, top of the line, cameras, high, uh, parabolic mics, everything. And they spent all day, just the two of them, combing the property. And when they got back, they reported, and they said that uh, they're not living on his property. They're not traveling through his property. They're going around his property. And it's a family unit. And they said that they also found one of the biggest X's that they've ever seen in their lives back there in the woods. But yes, that was uh, really nice that we got invited to go on his property. We camped there on his property. And I guess at night, Kane and uh, Eric uh, recorded some activity around his cabin at night in his garage. But that's as far as we got with that. They didn't go into details on anything else. So they said they went around the property. Right. And as, as the crow flies from his property, you could be in Hawking Hill State Park an eighth of a mile as the crow flies through the woods. So... They're trying to avoid people by going around the property. That's yes. what I get. Well, mind you, this guy has a lot of game cameras set up on his property. A lot. Oh, that's a deterrent for sure. Yes. That's why they went around his property. Let's get into both. He doesn't have any up by his house or by the garage. They're all in this the woods on his game trails. I mean, this guy's got a manicured trail. There's not a twig or a branch on any of his trails. Mm -hmm. He's out there all the time cleaning it. He has nothing better to do. Does he get vocals? Uh, we didn't get any vocals when we were there. And we didn't. Uh, I don't know if he got any or not. You know, one day we're going down there this year. Uh, we're going to the Bigfoot Festival in Logan County. And uh, I know where Hoppy lives, and I'm going to stop in and visit him. And I'll have to ask him that. So maybe next time we get together, I'll have an answer for you. Or if any activity happened since we were there. I would and that love was that. What, that was uh, six years ago. That that was that was wild. I uh, that was wild. So let's get into vocals. What's your? Do you get a lot of vocals? Do I get a lot of vocals? We get a lot of whoops. We get a lot of fake owls. We get a lot of drunken owls. We got these vocals one time, and I said, or my buddy said, "That's a damn drunken owl." How many owls do we know that drink? <laughs> and uh, my wife has gotten samurai chatter had them talking to her at this one place we had permission to be on this guy's property only one time he's got 147 acres the guy's 95 years old and he keeps his place manicured and uh it's not too far from where me and my wife do research. So that's why I wanted to get on this property. And what we found was to the west of his property, on the west side of it, I did not find any sign at all of Bigfoot. None. No tree breaks, no strict stick structures, no prints, no trail, a walkway. 
a trailway for a big critter. There's the deer trails. But when we went to the east, I found an 18-inch footprint in a creek bed with a torn-up possum. Oh, poor little swamp kitty. Yeah. possum swamp kitties. <laughs> I call them grinners. <laughs> You're a mess, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> let's go back into let's go back into your experiences. I know you've I know you've got a good team. Let's talk more about your team experiences. My what? Your team experiences. Oh, team? You are literally the only man in my life that never said they couldn't hear my big mouth. Uh yeah, <laughs> let's talk about some team experiences because I know you've got some team members in the group. And if anyone has a question for Jack, please ask. He's, uh, he's a book of information here. Yeah, team team experiences. What you guys just go out? You've you've known each other so long. You work together for so long. What are some cool experiences that you've had with uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch as a team? Are you asking me that or the audience? You, Jack. Oh, <laughs> well, a lot of it's been with Jay Fouch. Uh, mm -hmm. Getting vocals, a growl at us. I mean, a roar. Mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty awesome. Uh, we've been paralleled by him many a times. We can actually hear him walking. But do we see him? No. But we hear him. And it's not just on one side of us. They had us surrounded. And that's a place where we call Hell's Gate. And we did find a 22-inch footprint. Bill Walsh has a picture of it still. I somehow deleted my picture of it. Uh -oh. But it's with toes. Uh, that's, let's see. That's, that's about it other than the tree getting pushed over and the rock thrown at us. And that one time I got hit with infrasound. I got lots of wood knocks, but you know, there was it them. I would say maybe 75% of them was probably them. The other ones could have been maybe other humans. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe a woodpecker. I don't know. I have gotten rock clacking before once. That was pretty awesome. I was by myself in a swamp with my boots on, walking in water. It was probably just a little bit above my ankles. It was in a like a flood stage on uh, Cuyahoga River off of it in a marsh on public hunting. Uh, it's known for Bigfoots. Uh, there's a report in the BFRO, a report not too far from where I was. I found evidence of them being in there. I've never found a footprint in there. Probably maybe possible. And I think one of them, one of the possible ones could have been a bear. Because it was on an anthill. And it was it was eight inches, and that's typically what a bear print is is eight inches. Um, found some nice tree structures and tree snaps, uh, and and that's that's probably basically about it. Jack, you're like me. You're an old timer. You you've got experiences in life. You have uh, you know a lot of new researchers coming up and I'm going out in the field and they're just hitting it hot and heavy what kind of advice would you give uh, these young researchers out there uh, the first advice I'd give a young researcher is educate yourself on what mother nature can do uh, go to a arboretum or find an arborist and educate yourself on the plant life and trees that are in your area, because that's what I did. 
And that's how I found out that trees in Ohio, some of them have a natural twist to them. So when the wind blows it over or you get storm damage, it'll look like a tree was twisted and it snapped in half. Well, I found a lot of them like that. And mostly in the cherry tree, choke cherry trees up here. Um, next, I would know is get a tape measure <laughs> or have a dollar bill with you. Or if you smoke a pack of cigarettes and if you find a footprint, do yourself a favor because you're going to get hammered on it. Lay it down next to the footprint and take a picture of it so people could use it for a size comparison because that's what they're going to say. How big was it? There's no size comparison. <laughs> um, secondly, or thirdly, think like if you were trying to evade somebody and you were in the woods, how could you make it possible for them not to be able to track you? What could you do and what could you use? Well, the Bigfoots use Mother Nature because they are part of nature. Mother Nature will take care of them, and she has. She provides. Listen to the woods. The woods will talk to you. The trees will talk to you. The animals will talk to you. Just sit and listen. If it's dead, they deathly quiet something is there with you a crow will tell a, a crow will give their location when nothing when everything else is silent in the forest if you have that one crow raising cane pay attention to that crow yep and we got blue jays too blue jays are the same thing i call those narcs <laughs> 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 I said, Boy, damn it, I'm out squirrel hunting and they're letting the squirrels know I'm here. Yeah. Uh, but what, what uh, anywho, that's it. And just be careful and have fun. What do you think the link between Bigfoot and caves are? Do you think they uh, habitat in the caves or do you think that? Oh, yeah, uh, yes, yes. And I also believe they store food. They have a pantry because I found and also heard stories of big trees that have a split in them and they're hollow inside and they're full of mushrooms. And on one case, outside the tree was a long stick. Well, the thing was using that stick. Stinking it in the slot of the tree, poking and pulling out the mushrooms that it stored there and was eating them. Think about the old timers, a root cellar. Okay. Inside a cave. What is it? It's a root oh. cellar. It's a giant root cellar. They can store apples in there. They can store almost anything, mushrooms, anything in there. And it would last because they have to eat more than meat in the winter time. And I believe they store it. Um, well, I'll tell you this. You just hit something. Um, actually, it was today. I saw mid, uh, mid Florida Bigfoot had posted a picture with a tree with a stick sticking straight up in the ground at the tree. And you just said that. That's pretty interesting. So there you go. She probably, Marie, she probably needs to go back and check that area a little bit closer. Yep. Wow. What was, well, she probably already did. She's been in it forever. So shut up, Victoria. <laughs> so there is a relation for caves. And how about um, missing hunters and Bigfoot? Do you have an opinion on that? Um, what? Missing hunters and Bigfoot. Do you have an opinion on that? Oh, I like old bear's story on that one. Yeah, he's been on the show. So, you, you yep, I know. I, I've been camping with them. Matter of fact, I'll be camping with them next week. Mm -hmm. Him and the missus. Uh, I think, uh, I think Icebox is going down there too, isn't he? Who's that? Icebox. Icebox? I, yeah, he has a podcast in Alabama. 
Oh, I don't, I don't know. No, not where we're camping. We're going to be at, uh, we're going to be at Salt Fork. So you do think that um, some of the missing 411 people are contributed to aggressive Bigfoots. Do you think those Bigfoots are aggressive because I guess some are alone or the rogue Bigfoots, or do you think they could possibly be aggressive over their families? I mean, well, I didn't really know too much about that until I met old bear mm -hmm. and with other people and what they've told me, that's where I came to the conclusion that there are several species of these things. And I do believe there is a species out there that kill just for the sake of killing. There are ones out there that kill and eat whatever they can kill and eat. And then there's your docile ones, ones that just are shy and want to be left alone. And then there's the ones that resemble the Neanderthal man. They're more human. They're not eight, nine, ten feet tall. They're more f five foot, six foot tall, and they look like humans. They have a human face. Uh, but yeah, uh, anything's possible. And don't forget about this dog, man. That was my first encounter was with a dog, man. So yeah, let's, so let's go back to um, actually um, down the road, uh, Sasquatch theory. I'm going to tell my whole story on Sasquatch theory. Uh, but we just don't have a date yet. So if you guys want to hear about it, it's not really interesting, but whatever. Uh, so you're talking about how Bigfoot kills. Some people say they snap the back leg. Some people say they just break the neck. But wouldn't that be consistent with in um, David Pilatus' books where they found uh, just the shoes with the feet in them and the bones were broken in their body? That would make sense to me. Correct. Wow. But that also could be contributed to a dog man or the dog way that uh, old bear was talking about first time i heard of a dugway was the lbl a matter of fact i think i mentioned it on your podcast when you were talking to old bear because i listened to that and uh, a friend of mine jerry klein now i don't know if his story is true or not but he knows somebody that was down there and was in on part of the investigation and he says that they said it was a dugway now other people yeah. say it was a dog man other people said it was a bigfoot i i i'm still up in the air about that and if you try to talk to people about it and you mention something to them uh they get all mad so it is what it is. It was something nasty that happened to that family. And whatever it was, was pure evil. Do you run into a lot of cases in your area where habituation has gotten people in trouble? Um, no, not that I can recall. I don't know too many people that do that. And I know a friend of mine, when we go to camp, he goes off to his research area, which he won't tell anybody where it is, but he did take me there and he leaves them donuts. And what he does, he makes a little teepee. And the only way to get to the donut is either you knock down the teepee, reach in and grab the donut and take it away, which a raccoon would do that or a ground critter, uh, an animal. But when he, something gets his donuts, they move the sticks, take the donut, and put the sticks back. Wow. 
That's yeah. That's pretty incredible. Well, that's intelligence too, if it's an animal. Yes. Yep. So uh, I don't really know of too many people that habituate them. Now, when I'm at camp, I'll leave food out, like chicken bones and peanuts. And something very interesting happened one night, and it woke me up. I Missy gave me a bag of peanuts, and I left them on my picnic table. They were in a lunch bag. And what woke me up was I heard this crunch, like something grabbed the bag. And then I heard the cooler lid come off my cooler outside. Well, I got up the next morning. I looked at my cooler. The lid was on my cooler. I looked inside my cooler and my hot dogs were gone. I looked at the picnic table. My bag of peanuts were gone. I walked over to the sign because it had this ledge on the back of two by sixes and I laid peanuts across it with chicken bones. Well, the bigger chicken bones were gone. All the peanuts were still there. And later, I, I did forget to mention later on that night, I did see a raccoon run down that hill where the sign was. So when I got up, I walked into the woods quite a distance, walked back, went down to the driveway because I was close to the road. I walked both sides of the roads and into the woods for about an eighth of a mile in either direction. I found no sign of that paper bag. And a so small animal would have dropped it. Yes. Something took it and carried it off wow but that, that that was pretty that was a pretty wild night um other than that i, I did buy 10 pounds of peanuts for when i go down to camp because i'm going to give one bag to missy because she likes giving them out when we have our talks around the campfire because we'll, we'll have our meeting uh our group meeting at uh, 7 p.m saturday night That'll be on the 20th. And uh, the other bag, I'm going to put out a treat. And I'm going to see if my visitor comes back. Because wow. did you mention, uh, do you remember Bear mentioning that he looked down by a tent and seen a female by a tent and he yelled, Jack? Uh, don't remember. I seem is like your I wife? Did. Is your is Becky down there with you? Well, that was my tent. <laughs> wow! And I do and I do this call, an owl call, and I ask Bear, "What does this mean?" Because he says you got to be careful with your vocals because you don't know what you're telling them. And he told me. You're calling in a female. <laughs> you gonna get some sugar from a female? Can we hear your owl call? Uh, I'll try. Here you go. Ready? Uh -huh. Drum roll. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Everybody, that was great. So, no one in the chat has questions for Jack. No, I, I see no questions there, and I find that amazing. But they all know you, and I, and I think it's fascinating. It sounds like you've got a good group of guys up there in Ohio, and you guys are just uh, really solid together. And, yes. Um, and I was telling you, I want you know, I wanted to get some more Ohio researchers because you guys really seem to be solid. You guys really seem to have a lot of activity, and you just seem to have it together and uh, when you got a good team, that's all you can ask for. The worst right. thing that could happen is you have a campfire in good company. I, I feel totally safe uh, with the people I go out with. If, if any situation would arise, that there's somebody there that will know what to do. 
And it doesn't matter from first aid to having one hellacious of a, a, a gunfight in the woods. Except for Mike Cartman. He don't carry a gun. He's got an axe. Is that Becky? <laughs> My grandson's watching. Oh, okay. Well, he, he, that's know. his comment. He says, hi, Papa. I seen that. <laughs> I wouldn't mind get, you should get Becky to come over here and tell us about some of her experiences. No, because no, you guys no. are. No, no, no. Come on, Becky. <laughs> that thing, oh, that's no, she, awesome. Yeah, she's 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 going to bed. She has Good to go night, to work Becky. in the morning and they put Good her night, on a Becky. terrible shift. Oh, well, good night. She's got to close the store tomorrow. Oh, I hope she's safe at not doing that. Yeah, she works in a high end grocery store up here. She got a really good job. Oh, well, she's. Yeah, she's I want to show you one thing here. Check this out. Is that a knuckle? Uh, a knuckle print? Oh, that's a hand yeah. print. Wow. Can you tell us the story about that one? That belongs to a friend of mine, Thomas Shea, down in Kentucky. And the story behind it was they seen this thing down by the river or creek, and they weren't sure what it was doing. So when it left, they went down there to look to see, you know, if it was getting shellfish or whatever, mussels. Well, they came to the conclusion it was getting a drink of water and it stuck his hand in the mud to support its weight and that's what it is it's a hand print wow all five fingers that is awesome well let me see if i get a better there. picture of it. how's that well, that's pretty awesome Oh yeah. It, now you so you cast that or you're one of your friends cast that? No, that belongs to Thomas Shea. I bought that off of him at the uh the Ohio Bigfoot conference. That's his. And this is Dr. A, What's that? We've got one of the knuckle uh prints on the ground. But go ahead. Ah. And this is one of Dr. Meldrum's. Oh, wow. Oh. Okay. Wow. But you're familiar with that. I do have a question from Nancy. Nancy wants you to explain what a gugway is. Uh, all I can tell her about a dugway is I think they have a baboon face. They have uh, a canines. They're not a dog, man. They're more of a Bigfoot, and they are strictly killers. They kill to kill, not kill to eat. They kill to kill. Now, there's okay, other people that are more experienced on that than I am. I'm just telling you what I've been told about them. Good night, Otter. Um, Otter said good night. Um, so Mike H. says, okay, I'll throw one out there, Jack. What is your thought on rock stacks and tree st structures? Thank you, Mike. Uh, it all depends where I find them. So if you find them near a waterway. Uh, it all depends what kind of traffic's in there. A lot of humans, then I would contribute it to humans. Because I, I see a lot of that in Pennsylvania. They always, I see some pretty elaborate designs made out of rock stacking. Now, if it's in the middle of nowhere, I would find that very interesting. Wow. So, Tree structures, uh, the same yeah. thing. Uh, you have a lot of floods. They'll pile up wood. You got people that go into woods that clear trails that's their hobby or volunteers uh they'll stack stuff up i found one at wills creek that uh my friend says oh that's definitely bigfoot when i could clearly see that it was humans that did it 
If I had to argue with them, I know. Uh, it all depends. You got you just got to really look at it, and you got to make that decision. Uh, that's why I call mo- everything I find. Uh, 90% of the time, I'll say interesting. I won't say Bigfoot did it. Now, if I hear a tree get pushed over and it's closer, if I get a 30-pound rock thrown at me, (laughs) I know I'm going to say, yes, Bigfoot did that. That would say I'd go home for the night. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen this? You go into an area. You know the path you took, you know where you went, you've had some activity, little, not a lot, but you kind of know what's out there. You you debunk it. You can't debunk debunk it, but at the same time, you can't support it. So you go to leave the trail. When you're leaving the trail, two saplings on either side of the trail have been bent over in the green, uh, I guess the green vegetation on the ends of them have been tied and woven together. After I already went through there and they weren't there and on the way coming out, I would say interesting. I I went to a place in PA where this lady said she had this, she had that. Now, a good friend of ours was there the month before. While we went there, me and a friend of mine, Cliff Evans, he was... One of my good friends I grew up with, and he started out doing this with me. They had everything in them woods was braided together, like gates and uh, what they called trellises that plants grow up. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was those. There was a lot of that. Um, It looked like it was unreal. Like I'm seeing it though, is it being real? Now we did have something go through there that was really heavy that we didn't see it, but we heard it. And then when we got back up to the house around the fire pit, there was Bigfoot footprints. Well, here later on, we found out that this woman just does it for attention. She's lonely. She wants people to come out and visit her. And inside her garage, she has all these casts. And she goes out there and puts them in the ground or puts rocks up on her deck. And I'm pretty sure she's the one that's back there braiding all this stuff. You know, they're they're in their 70s. How'd you get that out of her? I didn't get it out of her. Uh, the guy that was there before me is a very well-known researcher. Uh, he's from Pennsylvania. He really does his homework and he caught her on their way back, putting the rocks on the deck and she did not see them. And then Later on, he told my friend Johnny Freeman about what he experienced and witnessed when he was there. Well, I can say this: we didn't, we didn't uh, weave them together. And but I'll tell you a weird part about that. Maybe someone in the chat has an answer for. I've never found anyone that had an answer for it. So where that vegetation was woven together, the saplings were. Something in the ground made a big U, about six foot wide and about five foot like tall. At just just a U was puffed up in the uh, the pine straw underneath it. Huh. No one's ever been able to answer that, or but you know, was it there when we went in? And <laughs> if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to know that. Right, I, I have idea. a friend. Kane Michaels, he lives down in the middle of nowhere in a cabin. Uh, He has a lot of activity around his house. He is a textbook researcher. He goes in his property. He documents every leaf 
on which way it's pointing. Every twig on the ground. <laughs> that's how serious this guy is. But he also leaves his mark for the Bigfoots to say, hey, I'm here. I'm Cain. Who are you? And he'll take material off of a tree or off of a vine and he'll braid these things and you'll hang them on the tree. This is my mark. And he has had stuff given to him in return or left on his deck at his cabin. Now he would be able to shine more light on what you're trying to find an answer to. If you don't mind, can you uh, send me his information through Messenger? Yes. He's at, uh, he has a page called the House of Enoch. Oh, oh, I already got that one. Okay. Yeah, that's him. Yes. He's yes, very yes. good. So, anything else you want to share with us? We've been going on an hour and 25 minutes. You already missed your NBA fight to be here with us tonight. <laughs> oh, your I don't watch those are... fights. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I, I used to be into it, but not no more. I it doesn't impress me. Is there anything? I don't else even you... watch football no more. I I don't do the football. When politics gets in, I, I just I don't I really don't like the fights. But if it's on, I'll sit down and uh watch it. But um, it kind of went downhill when politics got in it. Um, but that's just me. So <laughs> is there is there anything else you want to share with us that um the people may the family no in. just just when you if you want to be a researcher and go out there just keep it honest keep it simple and do not be afraid to share and talk to people because people will listen not all of us are the ones that will make fun of you or raise our eyebrows at uh you've got to get together with that good group of people keep your circle small very small and i have a bad habit i trust people and i used to post on where i was going and when i was going i don't do that anymore or try not to but you know just have fun go out there and listen sit and listen to the woods and if you know you're in an active area, try sitting there and just being quiet and listen to the woods and keep doing that all the time. Because I guarantee you, they're going to come and they're going to visit you. And then later on, when they get used to you and trusting you, they will show themselves to you. I'm waiting for that day, but I don't have the patience to sit there. Yes. I didn't when I was hunting, and I still don't. But I'm going to try it one, one day. I have one more question, and I'm sorry to keep you. Oh, go I'm ahead. A scent, I'm a scent person because I used to train and work dogs. Do you think they know your scent? A particular oh, yes. person's scent? Yes. No doubt in my mind. They know who you are. They know who you are before you get out of the car, before you get out of your car in the parking lot. They know who you are, if you've been there before. So at the end of each show, I give people the opportunity, if they want to, if you don't, that's fine, to pay tribute to someone. Is there someone you'd like to pay tribute to? It could be someone in the research world that's no longer there, or it can just be someone that's influenced your life. Would you like to do that? Uh, I just like to pay tribute to everybody at the campground at Salt Fork. I've always had a good time with you guys. Well, I think you are pretty incredible. I thank you for your time. And I would like 
Um, sometimes I've been talking about this forever. I want to do a wild card with different researchers across the United States. And uh, if I ever can get a wild card lined up, would you like to be a part of it? Sure. I think maybe I'll have some better stories to tell you. Your stories are fast. Victoria, I seen them <laughs> face to that face. Would be great. Here's what get, it is. <laughs> I hope I get dibs on that in the interview, but if you give it to old bear, I'll, I'll have to understand that. But I hope you do get what you're looking for, and I hope it's a safe and um, memorable experience for you. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, you tell Becky I said thank you and good night. Yep. And I hope to have you back soon. I'd like to say thank you to Dirt Road, Bigfoot, BBF, um, Old Bear, Nance, everybody that just joined in tonight. Thank you for the support and um, welcome to the Not So Perfect Bigfoot family. Yep. Thank day. you, everybody. Y'all have a good night. And see some of you next week. <laughs>